Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. We've been working our way through the book of 2 Corinthians, and I find it interesting all the different subjects that Paul hits on here. Uh, some really very helpful ones. And then we come to one tonight that you would think, well, how does that affect us? He's defending his apostleship. But there's some, some great lessons here for us. Now, the title of my message is, What Does an Apostle Look Like? <laughs> and you think about that with the Apostle Paul. Uh, the last couple of weeks, we looked at chapters 8 and 9, which talk about giving. And it calls it this grace, you know, the grace of giving. Important part of a, of a Christian, Christian's life. And it starts from the heart. You know, the, the Bible says that these were people who first gave themselves to the Lord. You give yourself to the Lord and everything else just falls into line, doesn't it? Uh, giving is no problem. Uh, we give by faith. In uh, eight, eight, chapter 8, verse 12, he says, If there be first a willing mind, we give cheerfully. You know, the famous verse in chapter 9, verse 7, Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth the cheerful giver. And we need to be people who have a heart to, to give. Uh, giving financially, giving... Uh, of the Lord, and so on. And God says he'll bless, uh, as we do. God's able to make all grace abound towards you. He'll bless you, he'll bless others, and, and God will be glorified. There, If you missed the last two weeks, that's it in a nutshell. There you go. Uh, but in chapter 10, he defends his apostleship. Uh, there were those who, who doubted and, and opposed his ministry, really. And um, so he, it was important for people to understand that as he was giving the word of God, this wasn't just a man's opinion. This was an apostle. He was speaking as, as the Lord spoke to him. He had, in Philippians, he talked about how there were those who, when he was in prison, would preach against him. You know, and he said, some preach Christ of envy and strife, others, some of goodwill. One preached Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds. Now, there were those who opposed him. And with a Christian flavor to it, you know. There were those who opposed him, obviously, that were non-Christian. But uh, Paul, uh, one of his problems was that he didn't look like an apostle, evidently. So let's read chapter 10, starting in verse 1. Now I, Paul, myself, beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am base among you, but being absent and bold toward you, but I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some, which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Do you look on things after the outward appearance? If any man trusts to himself that he is Christ's, let him of himself think this again, that as he is Christ, even so are we Christ's. For though I should boast somewhat more of our authority, which the Lord hath given us for edification, and not for your destruction, I should not be ashamed. That it may not seem as if I would terrify you by letters. For his letters say they are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. I just like to have that be the description that people gave of you. We'll stop reading there. What does an apostle look like? Now, evidently, we don't, we don't know. We don't have any. All the photographs have been destroyed of Paul. Uh, evidently, he didn't look impressive. And he didn't sound impressive. You know, he didn't have a magnificent voice or a, a wonderful physique. Uh, in, uh, in verse 7 there, he says, Do you look on things after the outward appearance? So he's, he's kind of giving the setting there. In verse 10, uh, he says the comment is his, his letters are weighty and powerful, but oh, his bodily presence is weak. His speech is contemptible. <laughs> um, it's interesting. That word contemptible means of no account, despised. I don't know what that might be. Maybe he had an Alabama accent or something. <laughs> uh, you know, you sometimes hear people think, ooh, you know, that sounds kind of weird. But uh, Paul didn't, didn't look or sound impressive. Evidently, he wasn't good looking. And uh, we think from some of the other scriptures that he had bad eyes. 
He had, he had trouble with, with his vision. Even his work wasn't very impressive. He was a tent maker, you know. Uh, he wasn't a stockbroker, a doctor, a lawyer, you know, something like that. He was a tent maker, very just normal occupation. He wouldn't have compared very well with Peter. You, know, you get the impression Peter was kind of the guy who walked in the room and said, ooh, there's Peter. <laughs> Paul walked in the room and, and you, you know, you looked at him, is Paul here? <laughs> kind of thing. Uh, he didn't look impressive. He didn't sound impressive. It's interesting that he uses the word there, his speech is contemptible. Um, he wrote powerfully, uh, but he spoke weakly or, or simply. Later in chapter 11, verse 6, though I be rude in speech. Now, he's not saying he said rude things. Uh, he's saying that he spoke simply, just, just the basics. And, you know, when you're coming to Bible concepts, that's really a pretty good thing. People need to understand the basics. It's not, we're not trying to impress anybody. But anyway, that was, that was Paul's, Paul's testimony. Earlier in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 2, he'd said, I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. He just had a simple approach, a simple message. Paul wasn't a somebody, you know. He was just an ordinary fellow who just also happened to be an apostle. <laughs> you know, you didn't look at him and say, wow, you know, what a powerful man. No, he was just an ordinary fellow. And I think you should know, Jesus physically was just ordinary. You know, he could walk through a crowd and you know, he didn't glow or, you know, there wasn't some weird thing about him. He was just a normal person. And uh, Paul was the same. The one that he wouldn't have, with his speech, you might think of Apollos. You know, Apollos was known as a you know, great speaker. Paul didn't compare very well to that. But Paul knew that it wasn't what he looked like that was important. A good Old Testament example of this was King Saul. You remember King Saul? He looked like a king. But he didn't actually make a very good king. <laughs> he, he had some real, real problems. Well, Paul, in the New Testament, he didn't look like an apostle, but he was an apostle. He was called of God. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. Uh, we can apply this, this to it. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 26. He says, For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. And there, there's the key. Uh, Paul uh, wasn't glorying in his physical attributes. He was, he was glorying in the Lord. Uh, that brings us to the second, second question. Uh, Paul knew that it wasn't so important what he looked like. What was important was what he looked to. What he looked to. What does an apostle look to? And this is a, a, another great lesson because we can look to the same things Paul looked to. And one was there in verse 1 of chapter 10, just Christ's example. You know, we look to the Lord. He says, I, Paul, myself, beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. He looked to Christ's example, what Jesus was like. You know, Jesus said in Matthew 16, if any man will come after me, you know, he wants us to, to follow him. In Hebrews it says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Uh, we need to look to Christ. That's where we need to look, look to Jesus. The other thing he looked to was spiritual weapons. And I think this is a, a real important um, difference to make. The difference between carnal weapons and spiritual weapons. Most of the time, our first inclination is to choose the carnal weapon. You know, the sword the knife, the, the gun, or whatever. Uh, but God has given us spiritual weapons for this spiritual battle that we're in. There's a really interesting verse. Verse 2 is, is kind of a little bit difficult verse. He says, I beseech you that I may not be bold when I'm present with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some, which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. It's kind of a hard verse to understand, but what I, what I think he's saying is, I'm not coming to overpower you physically. I don't want you to think I'm going to come in, you know, in like gangbusters. We're not going to use the, the fleshly methods to deal with this. And then he goes on, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. 
And he talks about using uh, the weapons that, that God has given to us. And, you know, we need to be careful that we don't try and order our life in the flesh. That we don't just look to the, to the physical for the answers uh, to the battles that we face. Uh, you know, guns give you a certain power. Um, soldiers and you know, having a, a high position. Money, uh, sometimes beauty or brains. Uh, there in, in um, verse 5, he talks about imaginations. You know, some people just think, well, if I can just think it, uh, that'll, that'll make it real. <laughs> well, uh, that's not the, the weapon that God has given to us. Uh, he, he's not, he doesn't want us to have faith in self. It's not in our mind or our body or our position or our money. It's in the Lord. And there are spiritual weapons that he gives us. In verse, uh, end of verse 4, but mighty through God, the pulling down of strongholds, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. There's probably a lot of things we could look at at this point, uh, but we'll just mention a few. One, I'm not sure whether to call it a weapon or not, but God himself is our power, and we look to God. Do you remember the story of David uh, when he was ready to fight Goliath? He, he pointed out this difference. As Goliath came up to him, he said, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield. There's the carnal weapons. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. Now, I started to say, Paul, David used a physical weapon, but he did it in the power of the Lord. A, very, a big difference. Uh, God himself, you know, prayer is is a powerful weapon that God has given to us. It's not just an emergency cord. Uh, prayer is an important thing to have a, as a regular part of, of our lives. God himself is our strength. Uh, it, when you go to the armor in Ephesians chapter 6, the weapon he talks about is the word of God, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And everything else is, is more defensive. I guess you could hit somebody with a helmet, but you know, that's not really what it's, it's made for. Uh, a sword is made for as a weapon. And God's word is, is our primary weapon. And, and it's just full of the power of God and, and things that work, folks. <laughs> you know, if you'll apply God's word to your life, uh, it'll work. Um, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, he, he talks about the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. Listen, you can get the physical weapon, but God's word is, is better. Piercing even the dividing thunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. You want to know what's going on? Get into God's word. Um, Revelation chapter 12 talks about the weapon of Christ's blood. In a sense, I, I think we can use, we can say that. Revelation 12, 11 says, They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony. Realize that the word of your testimony is a spiritual weapon. Now, I don't think he's talking there just about how good you've been. He's talking about what God has done for you. Listen, it's so important when, when the devil's lying to you, all you've got to do is, re, is remind yourself and in the process, the devil, of the, the truth of the matter. Yeah, he, he's called uh, the... What's it called when you accuse? The accuser, yeah, he's called the accuser. What's it called when you accuse somebody? The accuser, because that's who he is. And he's going to accuse us. Well, we just have to pull out our, our weapon, the truth. Hey, that's under the blood. Christ has forgiven me. I have a place. I've already got real estate in heaven. <laughs> you know, uh, we need to use the weapons that, that God gives to us. Right. Spiritual armor. And the problem, many people have dropped their weapons. You know, Christians just rely on the flesh and say, oh, I don't, I don't feel too good. Well, put up the shield of faith. Get the sword of the Spirit. Uh, pray in, in the Spirit. Uh, use the weapons that, that God has given to us. In James 4, verse 7, he says, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. We are saying to the teens the other night, you know, the devil's not real brave or anything. You just give him the Lord's resistance and, and he's off, you know. Uh, resist the devil, he'll, he'll flee from you. Uh, in uh, 1 Peter, he says, chapter 5 and, and verse 9, talking about the devil, whom resists steadfast in the faith. 
knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Uh, we resist in the faith, in God's word. God has given us spiritual weapons. The thing I see happen often is people operate in the flesh until they have a problem. And then they want to apply a spiritual solution. Oh, pastor, we're in trouble. What can we do? Well, the thing to do is to apply the spiritual weapons all along the way. And it'll help you avoid those problems. And you'll know what to do when, when they come. The Bible says, walk in the spirit and you'll not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Uh, use God's way now. Uh, a good illustration of that is our children. You know, sometimes we, we wait until our kids are teenagers. And we say, oh, Lord, help me. <laughs> now, the, the, the time you need the Lord's help is when they're little children. Well, you need it when they're teenagers too. But, uh, you know, we need to raise our children right from, from day one. We need to use the, uh, the spiritual weapons that God has given to us. We're getting a little bit away from the Apostle Paul, but you know, the Apostle Paul used the things that God gave him. He looked to Christ's example. He used the spiritual weapons uh, that God had. Uh, Paul used God's way. He looked to God rather than the flesh. I've heard this statement over the years. Uh, he lived by faith and not by figuring. You know, a lot of times we, we think, oh, I can figure it out. No, live by faith. Uh, so first he looked to Christ's example. He relied on spiritual weapons. But thirdly, he relied on God's authority. Uh, that's a real important thing for us to remember as Christians. Uh, verse 8 there in, in 2 Corinthians 10 some of the ways he phrases things, they're, they're real interesting to read. He says, For though I should boast somewhat more of our authority, which the Lord hath given us for edification and not for your destruction, I should not be ashamed. <laughs> now what he's saying there is, is, if I talk to you about the authority I have from God, he says, I I'm not ashamed of that. God has given me authority. <laughs> uh, Paul was an apostle, is an apostle. And uh, so he's able to speak with God's authority. And this is from the Lord. Uh, his apostleship came from God. And what he was sharing is what God had said. You know, we don't have to apologize when we say, thus saith the Lord. And we, we share with people what the, what the Lord has said. That's God's authority. Uh, in uh, 2 Corinthians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. See, he spoke with authority because that's who he was. Uh, and he didn't have to run from those who questioned him because his authority came from God. So that's, that's what he's saying there. Uh, he looked to God's authority. Now, you and I are not apostles, all right? Uh, don't tell me that you got a word from, from heaven. I, I'm sorry, unless you got it from God's word. Get it from God's word. That's the authority. The book is closed, folks. <laughs> There's no fresh bread. This is, this is fresh bread. And we need to get our, our, our authority from God. We need to be careful. So I hear people say something that they've thought of, and they pretend like it has the authority of God when it's not, thus saith the Lord. Be careful. Man, you can ruin your life doing that. Paul looked to God's authority. I had an illustration of this uh, some years ago. It was actually the church that uh, Mark at uh, attends. Uh, it used to meet in a gymnasium. And when I was the pastor there, we met in a, in a school. And occasionally you'd get there and there'd be people there that weren't part of the church. And my question to them was, do you have a key? See, a key is a symbol of authority. You, you probably didn't know that, but it means you have the authority to unlock something. <laughs> That's one of the things I enjoy when I go on a trip is I have no keys. I just, you know, all, all my responsibilities are gone. But anyway, um, and if I asked them, do you have a key? And they said no, and they weren't with us, they had to leave. But if they had a key, then they had authority to, to be in there. And that's, that's the kind of thing we're talking about. Uh, we need God's authority for what we do. It's not just that we're doing something. We need to do it because God says. And Paul's uh, apostleship was evidenced uh, by God's spoken word, by God's written word, and by God's word living in people's hearts. Now, earlier in 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 2, he said to them, Ye are our epistle, written in our hearts, known and read of all men. <laughs> you know, people were getting saved. People were changed by the, the power of God. Paul looked to Christ's example. He looked to spiritual weapons. He looked to God's authority. The question I, I would have you ponder this week is, what authority do you have? What authority are you operating under? Is it just your own authority? 
We, we read a book called By My Own Authority. It was a forger. He would write out his own documents. <laughs> he could go anywhere. He could, he could duplicate a document. Listen, that's not the way God wants you to live. Go by God's authority. Don't just make it up as you go. Find out what God would have you to do. Uh, as you face your day, don't just say, God, here's the, here's the schedule. Say, God, what schedule do you want me to have? Lord, what would you have me to do? Go by God's authority. But you know, there's one other thing that, that Paul did that he looked to. It was plain old-fashioned honesty. <laughs> Look at verse 10 and 11 there of chapter 10. Their description was, His letters say they are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. Let such an one think this, that such as we are in word by letters when we're absent, such will we be also indeed when we are present. <laughs> he said, they can say what they want, but I'm going to write and say the same thing. Whether I'm sending it in a letter or whether I'm saying it, uh, being there, going to be the same. I'm just going to be honest and, and open with you. You know, the Bible talks about speaking the truth in love. Uh, the truth doesn't change. First Timothy talks about not being double-tongued. First uh, Timothy 3.8. Paul was not double-tongued. He didn't have a different message depending upon a different circumstance. Uh, his message wasn't, wasn't changed because of who he was with. Uh, I've known people like that. It's a problem for young people sometimes. They can be one way at home and a completely different way at school or when they're with certain friends. And they don't see the hypocrisy of it because that's just that way they are here and this is the way they are there. As you grow, as you grow in the Lord and as you grow older, you should see that that's exactly what it is. It's hypocrisy. Uh, we need to be the same. Uh, we shouldn't change our message when we're with Christians to what we would say when we're with non-Christians. Now, we might say it differently. We might, you know, we might have a little different uh, way that we present it. You would present the gospel differently to a church person than you would to a non-church person, somebody who knows nothing about scriptures. But it's still the same truth, and it's still the same attitude. Paul just had a basic, honest attitude. He looked to honesty. You know, most of us hate hypocrisy. Hypocrisy mean, means one who plays a part. And we need to be careful that we don't practice hypocrisy. Uh, take courage. You know, speak the truth. Be willing to stand alone. Young people, you know, if you're still in school or you know, at work even, uh, it's, uh, it's hard sometimes to just be a Christian, you know, just to stand uh, for the Lord. It's not that you're pursuing them. Sometimes they're pursuing you. But you've got to be willing to just be honest and say, yeah, I do believe that. You know, there's, there's moral issues come up all the time now, homosexuality and marriage and so on. We need to be willing to say, no, that's, I believe it. God says it. I believe it. That settles it for me. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's, it's just not that hard. So a couple of things that we can apply to our lives tonight. He, he talked about, we talked about the, what an apostle looks like. Well, what does a Christian look like? <laughs> um, God designed you. And if you know Christ as, as your Savior, you need to just be thankful for who you are. You, know, you don't need to be someone different. We live in a world where everybody tries to be somebody else, you know. Uh, dress like this one or talk like that one. We went to the stage. Oh, it's been a long time ago now. must have been 20 years ago. And all the teenagers were talking like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. <laughs> it was very annoying. <laughs> all this weird way they, they were talking. Uh, you don't need to be someone else. If you're going to change, change to be like Jesus. That, that's God's goal for you. God designed your looks, your intelligence, your, your heritage. There's some things you can't change, so you might as well thank God for them and use them for his glory. Don't reject God's design. The other thing, what, what a Christian looks to. You know, just like Paul, we need to rely on the Lord. Not on the physical, but on the, on the spiritual. Now, God has given you your body and, and your intelligence and you know, the physical, but that's not, that's not what our faith is in. Our faith is in the, the God who gave them to us. Uh, God himself. Look to God and to the spiritual weapons, uh, not to the flesh. Uh, you know, we, we can follow Christ's example, like Paul did when he said that you know, he was doing what he did by the meekness and gentleness of Christ in verse 1. Uh, we can recognize God's authority in our life. Yeah, you've had it happen, I have, where you're facing a situation and you know what God says. 
Well, if you submit yourselves to God's authority, you'll do what he says. You may not enjoy it, although sometimes you might surprise yourself. Can I, t can I tell you a secret about me? Every time I go door knocking, I don't want to go. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. But I get going, I think, oh, this is all right. <laughs> I I've often thought, I could meet my next best friend or the man convicted of my murder. <laughs> you never know who's behind those doors, you know. Uh, and I don't go because I, I want to or because I enjoy. Well, I shouldn't say I go because I want to, but uh, I don't go because I enjoy it. I go because of the authority of God. And, you know, there's just some things that in life we need to do because of God's authority. Um, look to God. Use the spiritual weapons God's given you. Yeah, you're not helpless. We do. I've, I've been so aware lately of all the difficulties people are going through. It just breaks your heart sometimes. Every, it seems like everybody. <laughs> there's just some hard things people are going through. Well, listen, we're not helpless in this. We have God's power. We have spiritual weapons. Don't ignore them. You know, you can have the world's greatest knife to, to cut something up, but until you get it out of its holder and, and start using it, it's not going to do anything. And uh, this is the sword of the Lord. Get it out and use it. I, I often use these illustration of paint, you know. Paint's no good until you open the bucket and start splashing it around. <laughs> you got to use it. It's the same with God's Word. Use the power of the Lord. Uh, God Himself and Christ's blood be brave and honest and true. You know, there, there'll be some times when you'll just have to decide to go past your fear and, and to trust the Lord. And remember that verse, God hasn't given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. What a blessing. Uh, what are you looking to? Look to Jesus. Maybe you need to make a change. Maybe as, as I've been preaching tonight, you've been thinking, yeah, I'm, I'm not looking to the Lord. Well, make that change tonight. And, Every opportunity you get, decide to follow Jesus and trust him. I thought we'd, we'd finish with the song, Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. I think that's, that'd be a good one. It's page 322. Let's sing that. Maybe you need to do some business with the Lord. I, I don't know what uh, the Lord might be moving in your heart. But I found it a real encouragement to think about the Apostle Paul and the things he went through, uh, how he struggled with the physical, and yet he... He had victory because of, of the spiritual. Come, come on up and, and lead us in this.